Jehovah who brought us into the realm of grace. Hallelujah. I'd like us to read the book of Joel, chapter 2, from verse 23 to 27. 23 to 27. Hallelujah. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for, for you, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. The threshing floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. So I will restore to you the ears that the swarming locusts have eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I'm in the midst of Israel. I'm the Lord your God. And there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. Let's just read that one more time. And the place where there is Israel, you can put your name. Then you shall know that I'm the, the midst of. I'm the Lord your God. And there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. Hallelujah. I'd like us to read also 2 Kings chapter 7 from verse 1. Then Elisha said, hear the word of the Lord. That says the Lord. Tomorrow about this time, a seer of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel and two seers of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. Two. So an officer on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Look, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, could these things be? Could this thing be? And he said, In fact, you shall see it with your eyes but you shall not eat of it. Now there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate, and they said to one another, why are we sitting here until we die? If we say we will enter the city, the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we die also. Now therefore, come, let us surrender to the army of Syrians. If they keep us alive, we shall live, and if they kill us, we shall only die. And they rose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they had come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to their surprise, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of the chariots and the noise of horses, the noise of a great army. So they said to one another, look, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to attack us. Therefore, they arose and fled at twilight and left the camp intact, their tents, their horses, and their donkeys, and they fled for their lives. And when these lepers came to the outskirts of this camp, they went into one tent and ate and drank and carried from it silver and gold and clothing and went and hid them. Then they came back and entered another tent and carried some from there also and went and hid it. Then they said to one another, we are not doing right. This day is a day of good news and we remain silent. If we wait until morning light, some punishment will come upon us. Now therefore, come, let us go and tell the king's household. So they went and called to the gatekeepers of the city and told them, saying, we went to the Syrian camp and surprisingly, no one was there, not a human sound, only horses and donkeys tied and the tents intact. And the gatekeepers called out and they told it to the king's household inside, 12. 
So the king arose in the night and said to his servants, let me now tell you what the Syrians have done to us. They know we are hungry. Therefore, they have gone out of the camp to hide themselves in the field, saying, when they come out of the city, we shall catch them alive and get into the city. And one of his servants answered and said, please, let several men take five of the remaining horses which are left in the city. Look, they may either become like all the multitude of Israel that are left in it, or indeed, I say, they may become like the multitude of Israel left from those who are consumed. So let us send them and see. You can continue reading on and on. Restoration. You can tell your neighbor, restoration. Um, the first scripture we read talks of the Lord promising to restore. The Lord promising to restore. And as I stand here this morning, the Lord is promising to restore. He is promising to restore. A few weeks ago, as I had that word, it was about three or so weeks ago, during one of our Monday prayer meetings here. And as we prayed, I had the word, I am restoring. And I wondered, what are you restoring? So the Monday passed, and when we got into Sunday, another day we were leading worship here, and the word was repeated. I am restoring. I am restoring. And so at some point, I went silent. As people were worshiping, I wanted to know, Lord, what are you restoring? And I remember going back home and I was asking my husband, when you hear the word restore, what comes into your mind? They told me restoration means many things. It can mean you've been down financially. It can mean you've been down in health, it can mean you've been down spiritually and the Lord is bringing back. He is taking you to the place where he wants you to be. And today, as I stand here, because originally I thought that's my word. There are very many things that need to be restored. But as at last week, the Lord was saying, tell my people I am restoring. One as if you will. I don't know what it is in your life that needs restoration, but the Lord is saying, I am restoring. The Bible says, that's a prophecy that Joel was giving. He said that the Lord will restore the wasted years. But as you all know, very many things can be restored. Finances can be restored. Health can be restored. Very many things can be restored. But time in times of hours, in times of years, in times of minutes, in times of seconds, may not really be restored. Why? Because the locusts did not eat their time. The locusts did not eat their ears. But the locusts ate the fruits of the year's labor. It's that which you walk out every day, if you're going to consider in terms of uh, finances. It's that which you walk out every day to go and work for. And at the end of the day, you realize it's like your pockets have holes. There is nothing you can show of it. That is what we call the fruit of the years, labor. And so when God is saying, I will restore, he might not give you the 10 years that you lost. But what he's going to give you is the things that you should have gained within the 10 years. He will give it to you. He will give you divine acceleration. That if you should have been at point B, but you're still tarrying in point A, then he will cause you to have a divine acceleration so that you can do some catching up and be where he is expecting you to be in this season. And so he is restoring. And he's restoring many things in this house this morning. The things that the locusts have been eating. And locusts, when we talk about locusts, we are not talking about the locusts that we know in form of dede. That's what we used to call them when I was young. And we'd go into the grass trying to get hold of them. 
Now, this is more of a figurative. There are things that at times come in our lives that would behave like locusts. Because when a, when lo, a swarm of locusts have attacked a farmland, they ensure they have cleared because they come in form of caterpillars. They come in form after they have matured, they are flying. And they ensure by the time they are getting out of that place, the entire farmland, if it was a maize plantation, if it was a wheat plantation, it has cleared everything. All you are seeing is dry. Dryness. It comes leaving nothing, no trail behind it. And that's why the Bible says, if we can look at the book of Joel chapter 2 verse 3. Joel chapter 2 verse 3. It says, the fire devours before them and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the garden of Eden before them and behind them a desolate wilderness. Surely nothing escaped them. When you know the Bible is describing before the locusts come, the place looks like the garden of Eden. In the garden of Eden, there was everything provided. There was food provided. There was health provided. There was drink provided. And so before the locusts have attacks, attacked, it looked like uh, the place looked like the garden of Eden. But after the locusts come and sweep, it looks like a desolate wilderness. There is nothing. You cannot get there and get anything to it because everything has been cleared by the locusts. And when the locusts come in a land, what it does, it brings famine in that land. It brings famine in that land. I don't know whether any of us, but those of the older generation, the generation here yet to older than me, know that there were seasons when there used to be famine. And each famine had a name. Where I come from, it had a name. There were those that I used to hear uh, kind of my grandmother calling the famine called Gorogoro. You know? They have, the famines had names. But one thing I remember a few years ago, I was in class six. I was in class six and there was famine in the land of Kenya. It was very difficult to find a packet of unga for ugali. Very, very difficult. And actually they had uh, imported unga from abroad, I don't know which part abroad, and the unga that was brought in was yellow. And even that yellow unga was not very easy to come by. You'd go to the shops at that time and they would ration the maize flour. They'd give each buyer one packet of maize flour. You could not be given two because they wanted everybody to get at least a packet. Now the family, our family, we were eight of us. The two parents and six siblings. And so if you'd be given unga, a packet of unga, and you know unga is the step of food, ugali is the step of food where I come from. So if you'd just be given one packet of unga, that would only suffice for two days and it would be finished. Because it was ugali made for how many people? Eight people. It would be finished. And I remember my mother calling on us, me and my other two siblings, because we were old enough to kill. And we would go to the shops. We were living in Nairobi. It was in Isli. We'd go to the shops and queue behind her and behave as if we don't even know each other. Each person would be given money so that at least by the time we are gathering at home, we have four packets of unga to survive on. That is the... the, the, the the description of famine that I can remember, that at least found when I could uh, distinguish between right and wrong. And so when I think about the Israelites, the locusts have come. The Bible says that what the chewing locusts, according to uh, the book of Joel chapter 1 verse 4, what the chewing locusts had eaten and left, the swarming locusts came and ate. And what the swarming locusts had eaten and left, the crawling locusts came and ate. What the crawling locusts had left, the consuming locusts came and ate. Four stages of locusts. There was literally nothing to be eaten. One has a few during that time, the Israelites would uh, give, they used to give uh, grains as offerings. But at this time, because everything had been consumed, there was nothing that they could give in the temple of the Lord as an offering. And as we are sitting here this morning, maybe your life has been attracting 
swarms of locusts. Yeah? It first started by a sickness that struck a member of the family. And when sickness, sickness strikes, what happens is it consumes all finances until you're dry. Then when the sickness is over, maybe a child in the family decides to get into drug or substance abuse. And you've not recovered from the first one. The second one has come. Before too long, your job has been lost. And maybe those are the things you've been asking God. You've been in a place of prayer for a very long time. You've been crying out to God until you're wondering, Father, won't you listen to me? Don't you ever answer your children when they are crying out in prayer? You have called him for several years. Because you know, for locusts to come into uh, Israel, definitely they didn't come just one morning. Because locusts normally thrive in a place where there is heat. So it must have been for several years, they were hibernating for them to come up so that they can clear the entire farmlands of Israel. And so maybe you have been praying and crying out to God. You're crying out concerning your marriage. You're crying out concerning your children. You're crying out concerning your business. You're crying out concerning your job. But answers have not been coming. Praise the name of Jesus. The Lord is promising and saying, I will restore. One has a few. I will restore. A similar story is given to us in the second scripture that we read, 2 Kings chapter 7, of a time when there was famine. And not only famine, but the people had been besieged. They could not leave the city gates because the enemies who were outside the camp waiting for them, such that if they would have left the city gate, then the enemies would have pounced on them. The only people who were outside of that city gate were four lepers who were thrown out so that they could die. In other words, the lepers were good for nothing according to the Israelites. It did not matter whether the, uh, the Assyrians were going to kill them or not. The rest of the people were locked in the city gates. Nobody was going out. Nobody was coming in because the enemy had uh, besieged them. The enemy had surrounded them. And the Bible says that they could even purchase the head of a donkey. You wonder what they were doing with heads of donkeys. Were they making soup? I'm not too sure. But when you get a country getting to a place where donkeys become a delicacy, the situation is desperate. It was desperate. But when the time came for the Lord to restore, he spoke through his servant Elijah. And he said, Elijah rises up and says something that doesn't seem to make sense. Just like maybe I'm talking here today and it doesn't seem to make so much sense. Maybe you're telling yourself, I have been languishing in this pain for so long. What is this you're saying about restoration? Elijah rises up before the king when the king is reclining and leaning in the hands of one of his servants. And he is telling him that to this time tomorrow, there will be plenty. There is the sound of abundance. And the Lord brought a restoration in the land of Israel. Today we are seated here. What is God saying? He is saying, I am restoring your health. I am restoring that marriage. You have been crying out to me because your marriage is not working. You thought, I mean, many times you thought that if you got into that marriage, then things were going to be good. Most of us ladies, we are waiting for the day of our wedding because we imagine the, the grass is greener on the other side. Once you're married, things are going to be very, very nice. And yes, it should be nice. But there are times when you get married and suddenly the man you thought you knew changes. Suddenly, the woman you thought you knew changes. They are no longer the angels you used to court with. But the Lord is saying here, I have the power to change their lives. I have the power to transform that marriage into what I had intended it to. 
to be. Just wait on me. Just turn back to me. Because Joel comes and tells these people that yes, the Lord wants to restore, but you must turn back to the Lord. You must turn back to righteousness. And that is what God is saying here today. You must turn back to him and continue crying out to him because it's only he who will be able to restore all those things that you've been waiting for. You sit back and you say, you say, I used to pray for many hours. I don't know what happened. I used to love worshiping. I don't know what happened. I used to read the word of God. I do not know what happened. Today the Lord is saying, I have come. If only you will turn your eyes back to me. I have come and I want to restore your prayer life. I want to restore your love life. I want to restore your word life. So that you can tarry in you, my presence longer time. So that I can have a relationship with you. I want to restore the job situation. This thing that you've been praying about. I am right Right here and I'm waiting on you. Hallelujah. And when he restores, he brings back the Eden that you used to have. He brings back what is Eden? Eden is the presence of God and where the presence of God is, there is plenty. Where the presence of God is, there is healing. You know many times we pray and we say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The will of God that is on, in heaven that we keep praying about that it should be done on earth doesn't have sicknesses and diseases. If we are going to have that which we tell him to give us here on earth, then sickness and disease, the Lord is saying, I want to sweep it out of your lives. For the Israelites, the farmlands and the trees, the grape trees that they used to depend on for a livelihood had disappeared. There was nothing else to hold on to. Nothing else to believe in. Because the locusts had eaten everything. Nothing else. All that was left was for them to turn back to God. Because it's only God who would have driven out the locusts. It's only God who would have brought a fresh rain in its right season. It's only God who would have brought restoration in that place. And today, as I'm standing in this place, I know there is a woman somewhere who is feeling like all is lost. All is lost. Why? Because that man you loved walked away on you, left you with children. Then you held on to your children one of them is already in drugs and you're wondering what is there for? What is life worth? There is nothing worth living for today. Let me encourage you today and tell you there is everything worth living for because God is bringing restoration. He will bring back those children who have gone wayward. He will bring them back into your house and they'll give you joy one more time. There, is, there could be a brother here or a sister here who sickness and disease, you've walked into that doctor's office and they told you, you can only manage this. As if they have the final say. This one can only be managed. This one is called terminal, as if they give life. This one is called a terminal illness. I am here to announce to you today that Jehovah who has the final say has said that he will restore your health. He has said that he will restore your finances. He has said that he will restore your marriage. And so he is worth trusting because he is faithful. He watches his word to perform it. You did your KCSE and you didn't do so well. Maybe you had a D and below. And all that the teachers ever told you and the parents and your peers was that unless you get an A, a B, or a C, you cannot excel in life. I want to stand here 
and announce to you that all you need, after you had done your best, and the best you could get was that D, that E, or that C, and you are almost losing hope, I want to tell you today that God is just about to lift you and put you in the place where he had destined you to be because destinies are provided by God. No human being can provide a destiny. And so put your grades aside and start trusting in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Start looking up to him. Start calling on his name. Ask him to give you the direction and he will give you the direction. And let me tell you something. You will find yourself being an employer of those people who got their A's. Hallelujah. He says, I will restore. What is he restoring? Verse 24 of Joel chapter 2. He is promising to move us from a place of brokenness to a place of prosperity. A place of brokenness to a place of prosperity. Joel chapter 2 verse 24. The threshing floors shall be full of wheat. The vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. There are those of us who have been going through financial constraints until we have resigned to fate. We keep saying it's because our economy is not good. We agree with them when they are saying our GDP is not very okay. But I want to tell you today that the GDP of the kingdom of God where you belong is okay. And when he says that he's moving you from a place of brokenness to a place of prosperity, then that is what he will do in your life. Number two, he is moving us from a place of hunger to a place of satisfaction. Verse 26, we will have plenty to eat and be satisfied. That is in Joel chapter 2 verse 26. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. The Lord will provide. A few years ago when my dad passed away and we were left. And I remember we were told by our uncles that we will drink uji. Uji. Not your uji. When you're told you're drinking uji in my community, it's not on a positive note. It means you will suffer. But you know what? As we trusted in God, many times we stand together with my siblings right now. Both my parents are gone. But we stand and many times we look at each other laughing and we say, yes, we are drinking uji, but the flavored one. I want to announce to somebody here today, someone who has been feeling they are taking that porridge, that God is just about to flavor it. And you will choose when to drink it and when not to drink it. Because he's bringing you to a place of satisfaction. He is moving you from a place of hunger to a place of satisfaction. Why? Because you will have turned your eyes to him. And because he is our father, he is our provider. Fathers provide. And so he will provide for you. He will provide for me. We will no longer be in hunger. Number three, he is restoring us to a place of praise. A place where we will praise the Lord. We will no longer walk with our heads down. You know, there are times when you go through so many hard circumstances. You are wondering what you're going to do. You have children. You want to provide for them a meal, but there is nothing. And at times you come to this church because your children have nothing at home. So you've decided to leave them in the house. You come and tuck yourself in a corner in this church to call on the Lord because you don't want to sit somewhere and watch them die of hunger. I want to tell you today that... Though you have been going through that, though you've not been able to praise effectively, because he's moving you from hunger to satisfaction, he's moving you from brokenness to prosperity, it is time to arise and give him the highest praise because he is going to bless you. So he's giving you a praise. He's giving you a heart of praise. He's giving or it's restoring your praise back to you. Hallelujah. He is also bringing you to a point where shame shall not occur to you a second time. Hallelujah. You will no longer be ashamed. Just like the Bible says in chapter 2, verse 27. You will no longer be in shame. Many times, when you're going through the hard times, there are times when I know 
you've walked into this church and you hear a pastor standing here and saying, we are going to give for the DOI bus. We are going to upgrade hospitality. Come on, come and pledge, come and pledge. And you're sitting down there, you're wondering, what do I have to pledge? You are feeling embarrassed about it, even when the offering bags are going round, because you don't have anything to put in that offering basket. Deep inside of you, you are wishing if you could jump into that bag yourself and give yourself as the offering, because you don't have anything in your pocket. Maybe last night you slept hungry, and today you are supposed to give it. There's nothing you're going to give. And as you walk out of this place, you're telling yourself, what do I have to offer to my children today? What do I have to offer to my wife and children today or to my husband? You don't have anything. Today we want to announce that as he's bringing restoration, he's removing shame from you. You will no longer be disgraced again. But God is going to clothe you with his glory. He is going to cover you with his glory. Such that when people will look at you, they will say, surely there was a visitation in Millicent's life. You know, when the Lord visits you, you do not need to speak a word. People will look at you walking and they will say, something different is happening in so-and-so's life. He says, I will restore. I will restore. That which you've been crying out for, I will restore. The nation that you've been crying out concerning, I am restoring. The children you've been pr praying about and the family you've been praying about, I am restoring. And he's saying it's a time to begin catching up. It's a time for you to throw away your doubt and start believing in him because he is restoring. Just like he said that this year we are going to operate under open heavens. As we continue operating under open heavens, he is restoring because when the heavens are open, then he is going to release to you everything that you need in your life. It might just be a few weeks remaining, but he says, I will restore. You might be thinking, January left. February is gone. Now we are in November. A few weeks to the end of 2019. But I want to tell you that just like Elijah stood to that king that day and said, tomorrow at such a time as this, there will be an abundance in this place. I want to remind you right now that within these few weeks that are left, the Lord is going to restore. Because isn't he God? He watches his word to perform it. Hallelujah. He watches his word to perform it. He is saying, I've seen the pain you've gone through in your job. He is saying, I've seen the pain you've gone through in your marriage. I've seen the pain you've gone through with your children. I've seen the pain you've gone through with your health and with your finances. And I have come to restore. He told Moses in the wilderness at the burning bush that I've heard the cry of the Israelites and I have come. That's what he's telling us today. I've heard the cry of that brother out there and I have come. I've heard the cry of that sister out there and I have come. I have not just come to look at them aimlessly. I've not just come to stand there and do nothing, but I have come so that I may restore. I have come so that I may answer their prayers. I have come so that I may be the answer to their cry. The cry that they have been having through and through. He says I've seen your tears and I've heard your cry. I've seen your tears and I've heard your cry. Every other day you're going to the clinic and what you spend as consultation is high. I have seen and I've heard your cry. Hallelujah. As I invite the ministry team briefly, you can connect with somebody. And if you just feel like rising up on your feet, the Lord is here to restore. But remember, Joel told the people of Judah that they need to turn back to the Lord. Maybe you're here. You need your life restored, but you're not yet born again. That is the beginning of restoration. You can also walk here and just give your life to Christ. Because he will restore. 
He is the destiny changer. He is the way maker. He is the miracle worker. And he is in the house this morning. He is in this place this morning. You want a restoration of any kind. Just walk to one of the ministry team members. Oh, He will restore. He says, I have come because I've heard your cry. I have come because I've seen your tears. Those tears that you've shed because of that child of yours, I have come. And I'm here to change the destinies. The rest of us can just be in worship to the King of Kings. Oh God, we love you. And if you're seated there, you also still need the Lord to restore. You can just uh, arise on your feet and just tell him, Lord, you know this area in my life that I need a restoration in. I need a restoration in this area. We lift you, Jesus. Oh, we lift you, Lord. We thank you, Jehovah. We thank you, King in glory. You are worthy. Jesus, you are worthy. You are worthy. Miracle worker. You are the miracle worker. Come and do a miracle. A miracle today. Come and do a miracle. A miracle today.